Sure, the Israelites had other peoples that wanted to do them harm and that were enemies, but the enemy that came back again and again in the Old Testament was the Philistines. We could say it was like their arch nemesis, like the Joker is Batman's arch nemesis. Even Goliath, the giant that David defeated, was a Philistine. The negative portrayal of the Philistines in the Bible has even caused the word Philistine to become a word in English that means an uncouth person. I don't think we use the word that often anymore to mean that, but if you looked in the dictionary with the little p, not talking about you know the big p, the people, the Philistines, but the little p, you know, just using it as a as of our name, you know, you'd call, you know, if somebody's uncouth, you Philistine. Like the person that would wear a tux t-shirt to a prom. You'd go, oh, you Philistine, you know, that's an uncouth person. Um, we don't use that word that way very often, but it's still in the dictionary, and that was influenced by the negative portrayal of the Philistines in the Bible. And although the Philistines play a prominent role in the Hebrew Bible, their main deity, Dagon, isn't mentioned very much. He's only mentioned three times. Other pagan gods, such as Baal, are mentioned lots of times. Baal's name is you know, spread throughout the Bible a lot. We hear you know, them coming up against Baal. And one of the reasons this might be is the Israelites were never tempted to worship Dagon. And when you think about it, if Dagon's the main god of your worst enemy, you probably aren't going to be very tempted to worship their god. And so when the writers of the Bible, when God inspired them to write the words, they were thinking of the gods that the Israelites were tempted to worship and writing against those gods so that the Israelites would know not to worship them and to worship the one true God. And since Dagon wasn't very much of a problem, we don't have a lot about Dagon in the Bible like we do about Baal as one of the main ones that the Israelites later on in the Bible were tempted to worship. And other than the showdown that's going to be our main focus today, that's in 1 Samuel, Dagon is mentioned only two other times in the Bible, and the first is in Judges 16.23. And we'll be looking at a few verses in Judges 16 if you want to turn there. And Judges 16 is a story you're probably familiar with. It's the story of Samson. And where Dagon is mentioned in the story of Samson is verse 23. It says, Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god and to celebrate saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. The Philistines believed their powerless God had given them the power to overpower this man of God. Well, that's not exactly true. If we step a few steps back, you know, a few verses earlier, and actually look at the story of Samson. Samson had become infatuated with the Philistine woman, Delilah. After she repeatedly plied him for information, he finally revealed the source of his strength. It was his Nazarite vow to God to never let a razor touch his head. That was one of the parts of his Nazarite vow to God. So um, once he revealed this to her, she saved his head, and the Philistines were able to capture him, and then they gouged out his eyes. So it's not that Dagon had overpowered Samson, but that the Lord had left him because he had been careless with his vow to God. In um, 1620, just a few verses before I mentioned Dagon 23, it says, then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out before and shake myself free. Because she had done this other times, but he hadn't told her the truth before, and he defeated them. But he did not know that the Lord left him. So the Lord who had been giving him his strength wasn't there. So it wasn't that their powerless God had overpowered Samson or helped him overpower Samson. It's that he had been careless with his vow to God, and God had left him. At the Philistine gathering... It was decided to bring Samson out to mock him. Time had passed since he had been captured. His hair had grown back. And more importantly, he realized his need to call upon the Lord. So here we are at the gathering. In verse 28 it says, Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. He prayed that God would restore his strength, that he might avenge his eyesight. His motives might not have been exactly pure here. There were over 3,000 Philistines at the gathering, including all their leaders and bigwigs. So this was a big thing. And in verse 30, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died 
than while he lived. Once God restored his strength, Samson pushed the pillars. He was placed between bringing the roof down and killing all the Philistines in the temple. So at this first mention of Dagon in the Bible, we could say that God and Dagon are already 1-0 here in the first showdown. The other mention comes at the end of Saul's reign, and Saul was the king before David. He was actually Israel's first king, and his reign didn't go very well, and we're now at the end of his reign, and he had lots of uh, confrontations with the Philistines, and this was a big confrontation with the Philistines, and he actually died in battle with the Philistines. And after he died in battle, in 1 Chronicles 10.10, 10, the um, Philistines decide to take his body and his armor, and it says in um, 1 Chronicles 10.10, 10, they put his armor in the temple of their gods and hung up his head in the temple of Dagon. I know that's a pretty gruesome verse there, and it seems like the Philistines have a habit of taking souvenirs from war and putting them in their temple with their god Dagon. As we'll see in the story, we're going to be looking at the main showdown today in 1 Samuel 5. They took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the temple with Dagon. Well, here they took Saul's head and put it in the temple with their god Dagon. And so, those are the only other two mentions we have in the Bible of Dagon. And then we'll get to the main ones that we're looking at today in 1 Samuel 5. Um, from Tuesday, which is the first day that I was here teaching, we know that God can take on more than one god at once. He took on the whole Egyptian uh, pantheon. And God may have been putting the smackdown on more than just Dagon in 1 Samuel 5. One of the things that happened is when the ark was taken from city to city of the Philistines, there was a plague, and all the people in that city got boils. Well, the Canaanites had a plague gall named Resheth, and this may have also been a slam against him. You know, he wasn't the one doing the plague. It was the Lord coming in, you know, where he would usually be doing that. All three times Dagon is mentioned in the Old Testament, he is associated with the Philistines. As we have no written sources of the Philistines themselves, most of what we know about the Philistines today comes from the Bible. So the Bible also, you know, uh, preserves a lot of history that happened a long time ago because we've not been able to find any written sources of the Philistines themselves. So we know about a whole people because their story was recorded in the Bible. Now, um, we do know about some other peoples in the area, the Canaanites, and the Philistines were, you know, a member of the large group of the Canaanites. In 1929, they discovered an ancient city called Ugarit, that's in where Canaan was at the time, and this was a city that would have been a city at the time that the Canaanites were there and the Israelites were going into Canaan. And this gave archaeologists a wealth of information about Canaan at this time when they discovered Ugarit. And Old Testament scholars actually study this city a lot because it provides great context for the Old Testament. And in this city, they found a temple to Bel. And Bel was the main god of the Canaanites, even though he wasn't the main god of the Philistines, a lot of the other um, Canaanites. Bel was the main god, so it's not surprising they found a temple to Bel there. But they also did find a temple to Dagon. And back then, just because Dagon was the Philistines' god, didn't mean that he couldn't be your god too. A lot of times they would borrow gods or share gods with other people. Like, oh, your god sounds good, let's worship him too. Or, your god sounds good, let's worship him too. So there was a lot of sharing and um, going on there. And so there was also a temple to um, Dagon discovered there in Ugarit. And according to some Canaanite myths, Dagon may be Bel's father. The Philistines actually came to Canaan from the Aegean Sea. They weren't originally from that area. And there are some debate among scholars whether Dagon was already a god in Canaan, and when the Philistines got there, they did what a lot of the other people said, well, hey, that god looks good, looks good. let's adopt him and make him our god, or whether the Dagon was already their god in the Aegean Sea, and they brought him into Canaan, and the other Canaanites thought, hey, that god looks good, and they adopted <coughs> him. As for what Dagon looked like, and I have a picture on your handout of um, an old painting that was drawn of what he possibly looked like. Um, some scholars think that he may have looked like a mermaid, that he was this half-fish creature. And actually, for a long time, you know, if you read any older Bible dictionaries or something like from the 60s or 70s, that's probably what you're going to read is that he was a half-fish creature. More recently, Bible scholars think that he probably was a grain god and probably just looked like a person. And a lot of the gods did just look like people. 
the gods that you're probably most familiar with are the Greek gods because they're in TVs and movies a lot and they all just look like people. But that's a lot more boring. I like the picture of the fish a lot better. So that's the <laughs> picture that you get. And that's the exciting thing about biblical scholarship is the Bible is thousands of years old, so you'd think that all that we can learn about it is just going to stay the same. But really, we're learning new things by discovering new things all the time, learning more about this language that has been spoken in a long time. So as you can see, you know, just a few decades ago, everyone was convinced that he probably was this half-fish creature. Uh, the Bible doesn't say one way or another, so again, I mean, we're talking about things outside the Bible. Of course, the Bible doesn't change, you know, but we're, you know, speculating. And now, you know, they think that he probably was a grain god, not a fish god, and probably just looked like a person. But, uh, you know, it could be either. Uh, maybe a few more decades from now, we'll have more information and think he looks like something that was half steak. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it's something that you can always be reading new information. It's an exciting field that's always changing. Another reason that um, they think that he may have been a fish god or half fish god is in 1 Samuel. And if you want to go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel, this is where we're going to be looking at um, mostly today. And this is kind of skipping into the story of. Um, in the story, the Ark of the Covenant is put there, and Dagon falls on his face and kind of falls apart. And in 1 Samuel 5, 4, and depending on what version you have, I'm reading from the TNIV here, it says, But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. And the phrase I'm really interested in there is what's last there in my version, only his body remained. The ESV translates that only the trunk of Dagon remained. And your version may translate that a little bit differently. But if you actually go back to the original Hebrew, actually how it ends that verse is only Dagon remained. Which is kind of weird, you know, so Dagon fell and then only Dagon remains. We know the verse is talking about that his hands fell off. And so um, they think that maybe what meant there is um, dag uh, was actually a Hebrew word for fish. And um, Hebrew, of course, wasn't the language that the Philistines spoke, but all of the languages in that area were related. So a word in one was probably similar to a word in another language. So they think their word for fish may have been similar. And so they think when they're saying only Dagon remained, they may be saying that only the fish part remained, using that Hebrew word for fish there. Uh, one of the reasons more recent scholars don't think that he was fish is um, a word very similar to dag in the other languages in that area also means grain. So that may be why he was a grain god. And so the look at the showdown itself between God and Dagon that we're going to be looking at is told, as you can see at the top of your handout, in 1 Samuel 4 through 6. And the story doesn't start that good for the Israelites. It starts in 1 Samuel 4, and I'll start in verse 2. It says, the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. So the Israelites go into battle, and they lose. It doesn't sound like that uh, great of a start to the story, does it? Unless you're the Philistines. But just to spoil our Lord here, it doesn't turn out too good for the Philistines either. And going on with the verse there in verse 3, it says, when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring the feet on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the elders of Israel got together to decide what to do. They had grown up hearing stories about the Ark of the Covenant, like when Joshua led the people across the Jordan River. They carried the Ark of the Covenant and the water split so they could go across. Or when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down when they walked around with the Ark of the Covenant. So they decided to go back into battle, but this time they were going to take the Ark with them. And in verse 4 it says, So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So the people had the Ark brought from the temple in Shiloh. It was carried by Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli's sons were priests. And even though Eli loved and served God, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 2.12, a couple chapters before this, that his sons were worthless men, 
and that they did not know the Lord. They were on board with this, and that should have been a hint to everyone else that maybe something wasn't quite right here. The Philistines had also heard the same stories that the Israelite elders had heard about the <coughs> ark, and they were scared. And uh, we'll skip down to verses 7 and 8. And it says, The Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Did you hear something a little wrong about that last verse? Yeah, I'll read those sentences again there. It says, Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. So the Philistines were looking, and they thought that uh, the Israelites, just like they had, even though the Philistines had a main god, Dagon, they had you know, other you know, gods that were underneath him. And because of the way the Israelites were acting, they were acting just like all the other people in Canaan. They assumed the Israelites were just like all the other people in Canaan. They had gods. The Israelites weren't being the kind of witness that they should have been, so that the Philistines could have looked at them and known that they worshipped a single god, the one true god. They assumed that they must be just like all the other people in Canaan. And since the Israelites were treating the Ark of the Covenant like an idol, like it was just one of their gods, the Philistines assumed that it was just an idol, one of their gods they were bringing into battle. And going on with verses 9 and 10, it says, Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So they went into battle. They carried the Ark. They thought, surely, you know, when Joshua took the Ark across the Jordan, the river split, or when he took it around Jericho, the walls fell. We take the Ark into battle, we'll not fell. But that wasn't what happened. They took the Ark into battle, and they were still defeated by the Israelites. And even Hophni and Phinehas, that went into battle, died. Because God can't be dragged around in a box. The Israelites weren't honoring him, so he wasn't with them in battle. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died, and archaeological and biblical evidence even suggests that Shiloh, which is where the temple had been and the ark had been, was destroyed. Um, we can tell from the archaeological evidence that it may have been destroyed in this battle. But if it wasn't in this battle, from the way that we're able to date when it was destroyed from the archaeological evidence, it was shortly after. So not only had they lost this big battle, they even lost the city that their temple was in, and the Ark had been, and it was completely destroyed. The Philistines were probably feeling pretty good about themselves. Not only had they defeated Israel, they thought they had captured Israel's God. They brought the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Ashdod and placed it in a temple beside their god, Dagon. And so we'll go ahead and flip to the next chapter. In the first two verses, it says, After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. So they were feeling pretty good about themselves. They thought they had captured Israel's god. And they set it right beside their god. It was like they were just adding it there. Uh, they thought their god had one-upped god, or he had defeated god. And the Philistines resided in five loosely affiliated cities. And it's what we call the Philistine Pentapolis, because there were five of them. And these um, five cities were Ashdod, which is where the ark was put. And then there was also Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza. And um, these five cities, and we've been able to find, I think, four of them, archaeologists have. We just haven't found any documents or anything, you know, with um, information that the Philistines wrote down. Um, they still haven't found any of the fifth city, but these five cities were what made up the Philistines, and it's where they lived. Kind of like we have the 50 states of the United States, this would be the five cities of the Philistines. And it was their, um, they maybe had some smaller towns and villages, but this was their five main cities, this Philistine Pentapolis. And we'll look then at verses 3 and 4. Uh, when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They tacked Dagon and put him back in his place. 
But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and was lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. So they were feeling good about themselves. They thought they had captured a god and stuck him in there with Dagon. The next morning they come into the temple, and Dagon was laying face down. Well, they thought, you know, maybe the wind blew him down, or maybe some prankster pushed him over. So they set him back up. But the next morning they come back in, and this time there's actually pieces missing. His um, head and his hands have just been locked off, and he's fallen back down. So something's going on here. So once the people of Ashdod are afflicted with tumors, or um, sometimes they were boils or hemorrhoids, we aren't sure exactly what the word was there, but they're afflicted with some kind of sickness even, so things get worse. And in verse 6 it says, The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. And so the city of Ashdod decided, We don't want this thing around here anymore. But instead of getting it back to the Israelites, they decided, we're just going to send it to one of the other cities in the Pentapolis. So this time, they decided to send it to Gath. So they shipped it off to Gath, and we'll see what happens then in Gath. And you may have heard the name Gath because it was Goliath's hometown. So it's been shipped off to Gath, and we'll see what happens there. In verse 9 it says, But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, Gath, throwing it into great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So then in verse 10 it says, So they sent the, God of, the ark of God to Ekron, one of those other cities of the Pentapolis. So they just keep handing it off to one of their other main cities. You know, we don't want it here either, so let's hand it off to Ekron and let them bother with it. Now, things got really bad in Ekron. Evidently, the boils got so bad that some of the people even died from it. So things were escalating. Things were getting worse here. And so um, all the people of the Philistines, their um, leaders and bigwigs, their kind of elders got together and they decided, we need to do something about this. What are we going to do? And so they decide that they're going to give it back to the Israelites. But they decided, you know, now that we've taken their God, we've angered their God, we've got to give some kind of gift to them so that they'll, you know, appease their God. And in verse 6-4, we see the gift that they give. Uh, the Philistines asked, what guilt offering should we send them? They replied, five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the same plague had struck both you and your rulers. So they had five cities, and each of these cities had their own ruler. So it was more kind of like the United States before we became the United States, when we were still, you know, the Confederates, you know, it was a lot loose. They didn't really have a, a head guy over all of them, each one, and they kind of coordinated so they said, we've got five seeds, we have five rulers, so we're going to send them five whatever gift we send them. We're going to send them five gold tumors and five gold rats. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like a very good gift to me. If that's the kind of gift they give here when they're trying to appease, you know, this people, they stole their God, I wouldn't want to see what they give each other on birthdays. They decided, you know, the gift they were going to give to try to appease God was five gold tumors and five gold rats. Now, when my brother and I visited my grandparents when we were young, they had a box set of Indiana Jones that we loved to watch. We'd watch that again and again. And um, one of the movies in Indiana Jones is Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Indiana Jones finds the Ark of the Covenant. Now, when we were kids watching this, there was one part where our grandparents would make our shield their eyes because they thought, we might not be ready for the part. If you've seen the movie, it's where they look into the Ark of the Covenant and the special effects, which don't look anything real if you compare it to the kind of computer animation stuff today, you know, the Nazis that have opened the art kind of melt, they're all gooey, and it's kind of gross looking, but it's <laughs> very dated special effects. And um, Indiana Jones is the only one smart enough to know, you don't look into the Ark of the Covenant, you, know, you don't open it and do that and look inside like they did. Well, you'd think the Israelites would have known the same thing. They would have been smart enough to know, you don't look into the Ark of the Covenant, but the Philistines send the Ark of the Covenant back to the Israelites. And in 619, so the Israelites have got it back. And the Israelites do the one thing you think that they um, shouldn't have done. It says, but God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. So they got the Ark and they said, hmm, I wonder what's in there. They peer in there. And God kills um, 70 men because of that, because they weren't supposed to look into the ark. 
and they should have known better. So the lost ark had been returned to Israel, and the Israelites were still careless with it. And actually, the Ark of the Covenant stays here in Beth Shemesh. The Bible goes on to some other stories and stuff. And it stays in the same place where it doesn't really belong for a long time before David decides to go and send men and get it. But that's a totally different story. But So they get it back, but it kind of stays in this awkward place and just doesn't move for a long time. It goes on to some other stories, and then we get back to the story of the Ark. And so now um, we want to look at what this teaches about God or what we learn about God. And you can fill in the blanks here. And the first statement there, the Israelites misused the Ark of the Covenant. And because of that, they let the Philistines misunderstand the Ark. God gave instructions on how to build the Ark in Exodus 25. And right along with all of the other instructions he was given for the rest of the tabernacle, the Ark was to be made out of wood. And it actually says it was made out of a specific kind of wood, acacia wood. And then they were supposed to put gold covering all the wood on both the outside and the inside. And then they were supposed to put on top of it two cherubim. And cherubim were winged creatures. And some sources even say they might have had faces like lions. And they were supposed to just take a single block of gold and a hammer and the hammer these cherubim out of a single piece of gold. That must have taken a really talented person to be able to do that. And the only thing that God in um, Exodus instructed them to put inside the Ark of the Covenant was the tablets that had the Ten Commandments on them. Now, in Hebrews, um, in the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews said that also included in the Ark of the Covenant was the staff that Aaron had that budded to prove that he was supposed to be priest, and a jar that they put some manna in. But in Exodus, all that God told them to put in it was the Ten Commandments, and maybe he gave instructions for those things, too. We don't have the instructions if he did, but Hebrews said that those two things were also in the Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament. The Ark was not an idol. It wasn't even in the shape of a figure. You know, most um, idols at least are in the shape of a person or an animal, some kind of figure, you know, that you could recognize as a god. You know, this is a box, so it definitely wasn't an idol. It was simply a box. And God had expressly forbid any image to be made of him in the Ten Commandments, and we talked about that yesterday. Um, even if the Israelites thought, as some people think, that this calf was God, they weren't making another God, God told them not to do that. So it's still adultery. They're still being idolatrous by worshiping an idol, because God told them not to make idols. First, you know, God is indescribable. He can't be described. We, you know, the Egyptians have their cow-headed goddess, or the Philistines have their half-fish creature. We don't have a description of God. You know, he's spirit. Um, he's indescribable. He's so much far above us. And um, like I would already said, you know, he had forbid that any image be made of him. God did not live in the ark either. Um, his presence could not be contained in it. You cannot put God in a box. The ark was a symbol of God's presence, not God's presence itself. And in Exodus 25, where he's giving instructions on how to build the ark, Twenty-five verses, uh, verse 22 says, I will meet with you there. So he's saying, you know, the Ark of the Covenant is where he will meet with them, but it's not his presence itself, his presence inside the box. It's just what he had designated where he will meet them. It's where they kept in their most holy of holies, where only the priests were allowed to go in, because it's where God met with them. The Israelites misused the Ark by taking it into battle as if it were a magic talisman or a good luck charm. Like a basketball player might wear, you know, dirty socks. I wear these same socks all season. We can't lose. That's what they were training the ark like. You know, if we go into battle with this box, we can't lose. But God, they were trying to control God. But God cannot be controlled. Sometimes we pre we treat prayer like it's magical. The so-called prosperity gospel or the name it um, and claim it theology says, you know, if you want something, just ask God for it and He'll give it to you. That's not how it works. Prayer isn't magical. God's not a genie waiting around to grant our wishes. A Boy Scout badge isn't an achievement in itself. It's just a symbol of an achievement. If you were to find a Boy Scout badge on the ground and sew it onto your clothes, but you hadn't actually done what that badge was for, it would be meaningless. 
And it's the same thing with the ark. If the Israelites had been unfaithful, then God's presence wasn't going to be there. It was a symbol of God's presence, but that symbol was meaningless if the Israelites were being unfaithful and God's presence wasn't there with them. And so, ask yourself the question, does the way you live your life reflect what's inside? And that's that first question there. Does the way you live your life reflect what's inside? You can do everything right on the, in, on the outside, but if you're not right with God on the inside, then it's all meaningless. All the church activities in the world can't save you. Volunteering at a homeless shelter, sponsoring a kid overseas, or wearing Tom's shoes are all good things, but they aren't going to get you to heaven. In addition to being a symbol of God's presence, the Ark of the Covenant was a sign of God's covenant with the people of Israel. Covenant is a major theme in the Old Testament. You can't really study the, old, the theology of the Old Testament without understanding what a covenant is or how important covenant is to the Old Testament. And what a covenant is, it's an agreement between two people. And when they make this agreement, both parties have obligations. And the obligations of the Israelites in the covenant they made with God was on the Ten Commandments. And that's what was inside the Ark of the Covenant. God says, follow these things. And then his obligation was that he'll bless you. He'll make a great nation out of you. And he'll bless other peoples through you. Now, the covenant itself wasn't able to say. And no matter how hard the Israelites tried to fulfill their obligations, those Ten Commandments, they were never going to be able to live up to all the things. And in the New Testament... God sent something new. Instead of the covenant he made with the uh, Jews in the Old Testament, he sent Jesus to die so that we could have our sins forgiven. But the covenant still did something very important, something that had to happen first. It revealed who God was to us. Because before we can know that we need to be saved, we have to know who God is and what he expects of us and that we can never live up to that, to know that we need Jesus to save us. And that's what the covenant did. It established this law that told the Israelites, this is who God is, and this is what he expects. And then we knew when Jesus came that there was no way we could live up to that and that we needed Jesus to save us. And because the Israelites mistreated the ark, the Philistines misunderstood the ark. The Israelites weren't living in a way that made God's covenant apparent to the Philistines. Since the Israelites marched the Ark into battle, hoping it would magically help them win, the Philistines naturally assumed that the box had mystical powers or that it contained Israel's God. That they had placed the Ark with their god Dagon would seem to imply that they thought they had captured the God of Israel, or at least an idol of him. So, the second question there I want you to ask yourself is, does the way you live your life reflect Christ? Because other people are looking at you, and you're a witness to them. People will judge Christ and Christianity as a whole based on how you live. So before you make that mean-spirited post on Facebook, you know, if Christ lives in you, think about what it says about him. Or before you blow up at the person at the store, you know, think about how you're reflecting Christ in that. The Israelites failed to be a witness to the Philistines. They could have been a good example and the Philistines could have known who the real God was because of the way the Israelites lived. But they didn't because the Israelites weren't living in a way. So how you live your life must reflect what's on the inside, but you also want your life to reflect Christ. So because the Israelites misused the Ark or the Covenant, the Philistines misunderstood it. And the questions we want to ask ourselves there, you know, just like the Israelites misused the Ark, they what's inside wasn't being reflected on what's outside. They had the Ark, they had all the outside, but they didn't have the inside. And also because they didn't have it right on the inside, they were um, not being a witness to the Philistines. So also make sure that your life reflects Christ.